Okay, so today we're talking about bringing in the harvest, an introduction to sharing your work in USASC's repository for research, scholarly, and artist artistic work. So I'm Emily Hopkins. I'm the coordinator for the Harvest Repository. I work in the university library. I've been here for almost a year. Uh, previously, I worked at McGill in the music technology department as a project manager on a big shirt grant. Uh, I did library school through the University of Alberta as well. Um, and so I sort of have background in helping people share all these research products, as well as talking about like Creative Commons licenses and sharing all these sorts of things. So um, it's great to be here working on the repository for sure. So this is Harvest. Um, and so again, like I said, it's the university library runs it. Um, those of you who have submitted a thesis or dissertation uh, will notice that that's one of our, our major collections. Um, and so that's certainly part of it. And I'll go over some of the rest of it today. So overview of today's presentation. Uh, I'm gonna start with a really brief review of open access. If you've been to Didi's presentations this week, this won't be anything new, um, but just because it helps to frame sort of why repositories exist and sort of some of, the, some of their uses. Uh, what are open access repositories? What does Harvest do specifically? What do we collect in Harvest? Um, and then some specifics for how to share your own work in Harvest. So really brief review of open access. So as we know, researchers write and peer review articles as part of their work without additional compensation. Uh, and researcher grants and salaries are often paid at least in part with public money. So the internet means that the material costs of publishing are radically lower than for print journals. Uh, and so it's actually possible to make research output free to read for everyone instead of requiring people to pay. A lot of the time it's going to cost $35 to $80 per article, or they'll try to sell expensive giant subscription bundles to the library. Think kind of like a cable TV bundle, um, where sometimes the most valuable journals that people really need access to are bundled with a lot of other lower priority journals um, that can really put a strain on the library's ability to buy other resources for our community. <clears throat> the biggest publishers have very high profit margins on par with big tech and oil companies. I'm not exaggerating. Well beyond the true costs of what it actually, uh, what, what publishing actually costs. Um, and as the sort of weird bonus, a lot of these large publishers are increasingly reinventing themselves as data analytics companies um, and have made no promises about how they will use researcher data. So that's something else to be aware of in terms of alternatives to depending on them for the sort of scholarly publishing <clears throat> ecosystem. We also have an excellent open access libguide maintained by Didi uh, that you should check out for, for any other needs in this department. And so there's a few other kinds, but these are the two main kinds of open access that are relevant to today's conversation. So gold means the journal is free for all to read at the time of publication. This one may or may not have costs for the author, but um, this is one of the ones where you might have heard of APCs or author or article processing charges. Um, so the author pays. Uh, and whereas green is authors deposit a copy in the repository to make the work available. So this is free for the author. The version of the paper and how quickly they're allowed to share it um, is going to depend on individual journal policies. But that's sort of the main one that's relevant for open access repositories. So generally speaking, open access repositories are open infrastructure for sharing research output openly. Sounds like a lot of opens, but it's actually really important that uh, the research is open, but also the infrastructure that we're sharing it on is open so that we can guarantee long-term access and preservation. There are some services like Big Share where you can share things openly, but the infrastructure is still owned by Springer Nature. They still control it at the end of the day, which is tricky um, if we're trying to ensure worldwide access for everyone over the long term. Uh, metadata is an important part of how these work. So there's the file itself, but then there's also going to be structured information about the file. So who wrote it, the title, format, subjects, other kinds of information. Um, and that's gonna help us also index it for search tools. So something like Google Scholar can find items that have been deposited uh, even if someone doesn't visit the repository itself. Um, and then also for preservation. Uh, so when something's deposited, there's a, a URI that's registered to point to it indefinitely. Um, or a DOI, different repositories have different things. Um, and so then there's different kinds of repositories. Some are focused on a specific discipline, some are more general purpose, and then there's institutional repositories like Harvest. So the archive is a good example of a disciplinary repository. At this point, a lot of different disciplines use it. It started out as a physics thing in the early 90s um, as a way for people to share preprints, really early versions of their work. Um, and so it's still mostly STEM oriented, but there are also like BioArchive and SOS Archive and sort of related projects. Um, and then there are general purpose repositories like Zenodo, 
So Zenona was run by CERN, who are the folks running the Large Hadron Collider. And basically they've set this up, um, you know, as long as a CERN is doing experiments, they'll keep running this because sort of open science and infrastructure for open science is part of their mandate. So there's all kinds of things on Zenodo, but it's kind of great because uh, any any different community can use it for any different things. So it means that it's sort of hard to, can be hard to find things. There's a lot of different stuff, but it's widely used because of that. And then there's data repositories. So something like FERDER, which is the Federated Research Data Repository, um, which is uh, in Canada. And actually a lot of folks from USASC have worked on it. So this is something like, um, you have a really large data set and you need somewhere to store and share it and it will create a DOI for you. And we can actually include that DOI in your harvest deposit. So if you have, you know, a really large data set about research and then you have a few different research outputs coming out of it, maybe the paper goes in harvest, but we can link back to the DOI uh, in somewhere like further. So then we come to institutional repositories like harvest, which is ours. And so these are created largely in response to this need for a repository for open access journal articles, but they also have a function storing theses and dissertations, as I mentioned before, and also other kinds of research output um, that is created by the university research, the university community, whether it's staff or faculty or other members um, that they want to share for reuse that might not be captured by sort of traditional publishing, like technical reports or podcast transcripts or what have you. So what does Harvest do specifically? So some of this overlaps with general repositories. Some of this is more specific for us. Um, so like I said, it's part of the library. The theses and dissertations are there. And it is indeed a way to provide open access to journal articles, um, but also long-term preservation and access to things like conference slides, technical reports, community resources, and also open educational resources. So Harvest provides increased access, open access to research and scholarship, for more readers, wider reach and increased impact. Um, and institutional repositories provide a special kind of open access, green open access, and this is the key, it's free for readers and for authors. So this improves global access to both reading and publishing and is a move towards greater equity in scholarly publishing. Um, some other kinds of open access focus on the cost for the reader, right? Can you access the article, which is a key piece of the puzzle too. But obviously in the grander scheme of global knowledge production, we need to make sure that authorship is accessible as well. Uh, Harvest also ensures more visibility. So as I mentioned, it stores information about deposits in a consistent structured way. So work shows up in Google Scholar. So like, it's nice if it's showing up in Harvest, you know, uh, people can find your work there, but they can find it even if they've never heard of, of Harvest. It indexes it in other services as well. Um, better preservation. So one of the things it can be easy for, for links to die if everyone's having to host things themselves or things get moved around. Um, and so this can be a useful way of preserving output even after a project ends um, and people can use the stable and unique links created by Harvest instead of having to host files themselves. And of course, Harvest can help with compliance with like the tri-agency open access policy or other uh, granting agencies requirements that output be made open access. So what do we collect? So in the broader sense, some possibilities, podcast transcripts, reports, white papers, book chapters, articles, presentation slides and posters, open educational materials, video and audio, there is a little bit right now, there isn't really a good sort of broader policy around how much video we can collect and whatnot, because the current system, the video still has to be downloaded, there isn't a media player, so that's sort of something to be aware of. Um, we do have like an oral thesis with a movie and a handful of things like that, and we are currently working on the next upgrade of the software, which does have a media player, so I'm imagining that we'll be able to launch a sort of clearer uh, guideline for video and audio collecting at that point, just because the space requirements are different, but there is some materials and if that's uh, something that you that you need, feel free to get in touch and we can sort out the best formats and sizes and those sorts of things. Uh, so I wanted to give some more specific examples of things that are actually in Harvest right now. So there's the soils and crops collection. Harvest is sort of organized into communities and collections and they roughly correspond to different departments and different groups within them, but it's not comprehensive. Uh, by no means, if something's not there, does it mean that we don't want work from it? It's really just depending on where we've gotten work from before. Um, and so the Soils and Crops collection is one example I'll show you in a moment where they've gathered all of their work. Uh, and then I'll show you an example of a technical report, a journal article, a community health resource, and some theses and dissertations, which I just wanted to note are submitted through a different site. Um, but the College of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies has to sort of administer those to make sure they meet graduation requirements. And so once they've said, yes, this meets requirements, 
then we pull the sort of finished document into Harvest and then it also goes into the library catalog so people can find it searching from there. So this is an example of what a collection looks like in Harvest. So you can see the Soils and Crops Workshop has a description, it links out to their website, they've got their logo. And so this is something where they could even use this just from their website linked as a list of access to their, um, their slides instead of having to maintain that on their own separate page, or they can use the links uh, that are generated in each of these deposits. Uh, the next example is a technical report. So this is something that uh, this group of researchers needs to share, but it's not necessarily going to be published in a traditional journal. A lot of the sort of research institutes, different centers are, are going to be regularly having this kind of output. And so Harvest is one place that they can share those. Uh, this is an example of a journal article. So this is originally published in, I think, it's an Elsevier journal um, anyways. And so this is sort of following their requirements for what kind of license and which version of the file can be shared. So you can see it says approved manuscript there. Um, and so that's an example of, of that green open access option. And then here is a community health resource. So this is in the academic family medicine and the nursing collections. Um, and so this can also be made available in Harvest for the long term, make it easier to share with uh, a wide group of people, right? Because this is this is viewable by anyone. And then finally, this is an example of uh, a dissertation in this case. And so these are submitted through the thesis and dissertation system, which is just worth being aware of if you or your students uh, are submitting. It will end up in Harvest, but that's not actually where you go to deposit it in the first place. And we also have a new open educational resources collection. I've been working with the folks at Gwenham Law Center, Center for Teaching and Learning, but anyone creating open educational resources is welcome to contribute. So if that's something that, that you or your students are working on, uh, feel free to get in touch. It's still a pretty new collection, so we're still sorting out some of how it's organized, but uh, there's a lot of folks working on that here, so that's exciting too. And then also undergraduate research. So current, most recently, we've had a lot of new posters coming in from some nutrition students and uh, the Summer Sure Symposium students. Um, so that's been a great way for them to get involved and learn more about what it means to share their work and open access and those sorts of things. Um, coming back to this idea of like labs or grants having collections. So this is sort of similar to the soils and crops example um, where they're using collection as like a way to track and share research output. This isn't necessary. The work will still be indexed and shared in Google Scholar. The links will still work even if the collection doesn't organize it. But if it's useful to, to you or your group, it's certainly something we can set up. Uh, for example, at my previous job, I worked for a grant called SIMSA, which is the single interface for music score searching and analysis. And we had to track all the research products for sure so we could report them, which is a pretty common situation. And we came up with this complicated combination of putting things in own cloud and then having citations from Zotero and updating our website. And it worked okay, but it was sort of a hodgepodge of things. And it was sometimes hard to make sure that things stayed up to date as different people contributed. Um, and so either maintaining your own website where some of these things that either don't have uh, a resource or that are based on this cloud thing um, could use something from Harvest instead. So just as one possible use case for sure. So now I want to get into sort of some of the practicalities of how to share work in Harvest. Um, so you'll see when you go to deposit, it'll say that you need to get permission to submit. Permissions are managed on a collection basis. It's not that you get added to all of Harvest, you get added to a specific collection or collections that you want to contribute to. Um, if you have like a, a research group or a class that are all going to be contributing, you can contact me with their NSIDs and I can add them in a batch. They don't all have to contact me individually and we can make new collections too uh, if there are gaps, which I know there are, or if there are particular grants or projects that you think it would be useful for, that's something we can do. So some of the key concepts for depositing work in Harvest, this is sort of, you know, may seem like a lot the first time, but once you get used to working in this way, it becomes a lot easier to just be able to share everything. So there's a bit of a learning curve for the first deposit, and then it starts to become uh, a habit just of how you share your research to become part of it. So there's ORCID, uh, Creative Commons licensing as applicable, to Harvest license, um, licensing for your journal articles specifically, and making sure you have the right version there, uh, and then just a brief note on file names. So ORCID is the Open Researcher and Contributor ID. The USAS library has a page with some more information about it, but the, and there are sort of some interesting features in terms of like keeping track of your own profile and those sorts of things. Um, but one of the really important uses for it in Harvest is as a unique identifier for you. So if your name is really common, if your name changes, if you go by different names, 
Um, you can keep track of that with your ORCID profile, and then all we need is the identifier that points back to that ORCID profile. So it's a really useful way to make sure that all of your work shows up under one author and harvest and that you have control over your name. Um, and if you've submitted in the past and there's some, some drift and some of them have ORCID and some don't, and one of them has, you know, uh, whatever, we can fix that. Um, you can just submit a ticket with your ORCID link and, and let me know and we can get that sorted out. Creative Commons licensing. So copyright is automatic. So if I make something and share it online, it's automatically all rights reserved to me. Um, in some cases, that's fine. But in a lot of cases, especially when we're sharing the kind of work that a lot of people are doing at the university, we're actually fine with other people sharing it or reusing it as long as they give us credit. And so Creative Commons is kind of like copyright for the internet. Like it accounts for how easy it is to share things on the internet um, and makes it easier for people to give you the kind of credit that you want or um, to, without having to ask you specifically. Um, even if you're around and available to ask, a lot of the time people are trying to use stuff at the last minute. They don't necessarily have time to request copyright permissions. They might be thinking through, well, you know, is this fair use or not? Fair dealing, sorry, or not? Um, or you can specify ahead of time what the terms are that you'd like to use for reuse. So people can share or reuse work without having to ask you specifically. So I recommend this uh, where appropriate a lot. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for people to share your work, which in a lot of cases, especially if we're not getting paid for it anyways, that's sort of the, the highest form of currency in these contexts is making sure that our work is shared with, with attribution. And there's a Creative Commons license picker they can help you choose. There's a few different variations. So whether it's just that you want attribution, whether you say, sure, you can share this, but not for commercial purposes, or you can share this as long as anything you create based on it is shared with a similar license. Um, you can share it, but you can't change it. There's a few variations like that. Um, and if you're not sure about which one to use, I'm always happy to help sort that out um, for sure. If there's, again, you know, a little bit to learn, but the, the picker is very helpful in narrowing down the possibilities. For journal articles specifically, this is going to depend a little more on the journal itself and your publication agreement. So the article I showed you earlier is published by Elsevier, and in that case, the accepted manuscript can be shared CC, BUI, NC, ND. So Creative Commons attributions, you need to say who it's from. NC means not, you can't reuse this for commercial purposes, and ND means no derivative. So you can't make derivative works from it. You can just share it as is. Um, this one's like the closest to all rights reserved just with the added version that someone can share the actual article, article around on their website or what have you. Um, the two tools that I recommend for helping with this sort of if, you know, if you don't have access to your publication agreement or you're trying to help someone figure it out or you just need additional uh, input is Sherpa Romeo. Um, and then so that's just looking it up based on the journal and then share your paper as a tool that helps automate some of this process for papers with a DOI. So you do need a DOI to look it up. So if not, Sherpa Romeo is going to be your best bet. But if you have a DOI, it's worth going here to share your paper and you enter the DOI and then it automatically helps look up some of the policies. So you can see here it's decided. You can freely share your paper with check and applied geochemistry encourages you to share your paper. Those little footnotes, the one and two at the end there are actually the links to the policy as share your paper found them. So you can go and double check. You can go and see uh, if, if they're relevant just to be, be sure. Um, and then it gives you instructions for what to do next. So find the manuscript, the journal accepted, it's not a PDF from the journal site. So in this case, they let you share the accepted manuscript. So it's what you sent the publisher after peer review, but before formatting. Um, and then it says to check that there aren't logos or formatting just to make sure you have the right version. Different journals will have different policies. This is just for this journal that these examples apply. Um, so you can try using share your paper for your own or check on Sherpa or mail, but that's sort of what it helps, what it helps do. The harvest license uh, is a non-exclusive license. It's not like transferring copyright to harvest or anything like that. It just means that we can move the file around or migrate it to new formats as needed for preservation. Um, this is partly because uh, some of the materials can be all rights reserved. The Creative Commons step is optional because Creative Commons license would allow us to do a lot of this without the Harvest license, but because we do have all rights reserved works um, and also some Creative Commons would be like no derivatives, we need this license as well. <laughs> so that if we need to change how it's hosted or migrate to a new format for presentation, sorry, preservation, that we can, that we can do that. Um, and if you're gonna be depositing on behalf of someone else, this is part of what you need to get them to agree to ahead of time. Um, so they need to, to know about the Harvest license and the Creative Commons license, and it's available on our website with the guidelines, um, and I can always answer questions about it as well. 
So up next, I wanted to just briefly talk about file naming. Um, file names are only constrained for theses and dissertations on harvest. Anything else, whatever name you have, is what will end up in harvest. So you have control over it, which is good, but it also means that, you know, if untitled 243.doc ends up in harvest and then someone downloads it on their computer, it's not, it's not very informative for them. So a few sort of basic guidelines. Um, I'm not saying every file name you ever work with on your computer has to be consistently and perfectly named. I'm not coming for your desktop or your documents folder. Um, the thing that I like to imagine is like, if all the files in Harvest fell on the floor, would we be able to figure out which one was which without opening every single file? Or a more realistic scenario is like someone's downloaded several things from Harvest and they're trying to tell them apart. So I've got a few examples here. In the first scenario, you can see they're not all the same but they have some information about like the content, the date, the type of thing, who's involved. Um, this middle category is sort of what happens when people's work moves from the context of their computer, where my article or my slides is very relevant into the context of sharing with other people. So it's better than nothing, but more context is good. And then the last ones are like, please avoid, because untitled gives me nothing. Project final has spaces. Um, some things get grumpy about spaces. It's better to avoid them if you can. There are examples of, of, of file names that have spaces in Harvest. So it's not like a total deal breaker, but I do recommend avoiding it if you can. And then special characters, please, please avoid. So those are sort of the, the basics. There's a link there um, to a data management page from Harvard that has some other good tips. If you want really specifics for like, you're trying to work out good file naming conventions for a bunch of data for a project or something like that. This is not that high of a level. This is just like, make sure you can figure out what the file is. Different standards can apply to different situations. Um, and as far as file types specifically, um, PDF tends to be the bulk of what's in Harvest, but it is okay or good to have a format other than PDF if there's a good reason. A lot of the time you'll see PowerPoint and PDF, for example, for slides or Word and PDF for some open educational resources. Um, this is mostly just so that if someone doesn't have Word or PowerPoint, which are proprietary formats on their computer, that they can still open it and look at it. Most people can open a PDF. Um, and so we're trying to balance the usefulness of a doc or a PowerPoint if someone wants to download it and look at it or, or reuse it if you've said that's permissible um, with the broad viewability and preservation of a PDF. If it's an Excel or similar, ideally you'd include a CSV too, but sometimes that won't have the same information. Excel covers a lot more. Um, and so when in doubt, please get in touch and I can help you figure out the most stable open format we can use. But this is just, again, access and preservation and what we can do to to ensure the highest possible level for that. We'll, 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 we'll figure it out. We'll do our best with whatever you give us. This is just sort of pointing towards uh, what we'll be able to do the most with in terms of ensuring long-term access. So now I'm gonna take you briefly through the actual submission process, what it looks like on the site. Um, so you, this is assuming you've already been added to a collection. So you'll come here and it says select a collection and you can choose one. Uh, and then the deposit process itself, so there's this description stage where we're going to enter a bunch of metadata, the upload stage where we'll add the file or files that are needed for the deposit. And then at that point, you review the metadata and the files to make sure everything's in order. Uh, optionally, the Creative Commons license and then the Harvest license, and then you submit your item. So here, there's one thing I wanted to mention is this lookup uh, beside the authors. So that's partly for ORCID. If you want to do an ORCID lookup, it'll pull it in from from the ORCID site and there, there's a little green ORCID logo that will show up and it'll link back out to your ORCID profile, which is great. But even if you don't have an ORCID or your co-author doesn't have an ORCID, if you've deposited anything else in Harvest already, you can look up their name and it'll ensure that it uses the same like database record for the name instead of accidentally making a new one. Um, so it can be a good way to make sure that things are consistent. Um, then enter the title, this next page, the date, whatever is most relevant. Year is the thing that we really need for copyright purposes, but if month and day are relevant for the publication, by all means, include them. Only enter publisher if there's actually a publisher, if it's something that you're sharing, and this is sort of the place that it's being shared. You don't have to make up a publisher. Again, it's optional. Um, citation is also optional. You'll see it. You saw it maybe in a couple of the examples I showed. It's just an easy way to make sure that people capture the information that you want them to share. Um, and then if it's part of a series, all this sort of stuff. But again, a lot of this won't be relevant for everything you're depositing. Uh, identifiers and then type. So what is it? It's a book, it's an article, it's a poster. Um, we can modify this a little bit. So if there's like something that comes up a lot that you think that it really should have, please talk to me. 
Um, but we don't want there to be too much variation because it helps a lot when we're searching if, if things are in sort of bigger buckets as well. Um, and the Open Educational Resources Collection does have an additional list of, of metadata specific to open educational resources as well. So you'll see that if you're depositing. This is uh, not in that collection. Um, and then whether or not something's peer reviewed. Um, what language it's in. There's a handful of languages that are in Harvest that are not on this drop down yet. Um, again, that is something I'm working on. And also feel free to contact me if you need either a language that's not on this list or an additional language because we can modify the final record to include it, even if you can't do it as part of the deposit process. Um, making sure that's accurate is really important to me. So please do, please do get in touch for sure. Um, on this next page, you can enter the abstract if there is one. Uh, any keywords, don't sweat this one too hard, two to five keywords that are representative. Um, if you know the relevant mesh subject keywords, there's a separate field for that. So please include those in there. That's like a controlled vocabulary that's useful. We can do a lot with that. So make sure that you actually put those there. Um, funding agency. So if there's like a specific statement that your grant asks you to put on things, you can add that here, or you can just name the funding agency, whatever's most appropriate. Um, and then the description is for anything else that isn't covered by these previous uh, categories. But if it does fit in one of those, try to put them in one of those just because it means we can we can search by it and filter by it. But use the description field for anything that else that you need to include. So at this stage, we're going to upload files. Um, so you can see you can browse and select a file or more than one file if you need to include multiple formats or supplementary materials. Um, and then at this point, you can also put in a date for an embargo. So maybe you're sharing a journal article, but you're only allowed to share it after six months. You don't have to wait six months. You can come deposit it and harvest right away. And we'll take care of the embargo period for you. Um, or if you need to embargo something for another reason. You don't have to put the reason, though. Most of the time, people just put a date. But if there's some extenuating factor, feel free to put a note. Um, at this point, you review it, so making sure that all the metadata and files are correct before you move on to submission. Because once you deposit, you can't make changes anymore. In order for us to be able to preserve it and make sure that it's available long term and that if someone cites it, it's still going to be the same thing, <laughs> we need to be the only ones who can make changes, basically. So the bar is a little bit high for, for changing things once they, are, once they are deposited. So this is just a good chance to check. Obviously, if there's a typo or whatever, get in touch and fix it, but it's just a good opportunity to to make sure everything is right. At this point, if you wish, you can add a Creative Commons license. Um, license type does also include all rights reserved. I've shown what the options are for Creative Commons here, um, just so that you can see what that dialogue looks like, but all rights reserved is also possible. Um, and so it sort of takes you through a couple of the different options um, for Creative Commons licenses. And then there's the Harvest distribution license that we've already discussed. And so once that's done, uh, it's complete and your item will show up in Harvest moments later. The thumbnail will be generated overnight most of the time. So sometimes the, the picture will just be a gray box because that job happens overnight. Um, and you can see here, so we've got our thumbnail, the link to the article, all the metadata we put in, our Creative Commons logo at the bottom. And I wanted to highlight circled in magenta there is the URI, which is the Uniform Resource Identifier. It functions very similarly to a DOI, which you probably more familiar with, but basically it just means that that um, address has been registered with handle.net. And so that is what's going to continue to point to this resource. Whatever is in your web browser is how the university is currently hosting this software. Um, it doesn't change a lot, but it might change faster than this is going to change. This is what we're saying is going to keep pointing to this resource. So if you need a link to put in a CV, on your website, et cetera, that's the one to use. I wanted to return quickly. What if the article needs to be embargoed? So as I mentioned, you can still deposit right away and set the date for lifting the embargo. If it needs to be extended, contact me, we can do that too. Um, but Harvest is also set up so that someone who wants to read your article can request a copy within Harvest. Many publishers allow authors to share their work directly on request. So even if you can't put it publicly on your website yet, if a colleague says, hey, can I, can I see the, your research? You can send them a personal copy. And so this um, this is a good example here. So this article is embargoed. You can see the abstract. You know, I've read it. I really would like to see their results. Um, so if I click on that article that's been embargoed, this form pops up that says request a copy of the document. And so I can request it through, through Harvest and you can decide to send it within Harvest. So again, you don't have to keep track of the date or, or that separately. And you can deposit your article right away, regardless of how long it needs to be embargoed. 
Um, so that's it for depositing. There's a few additional resources you should be aware of. So there's Harvest. There's a YouTube video I made about depositing a poster in Harvest. I made it for the first year research experience students, um, but it still goes over this basic process. And it's only about five or six minutes long. Uh, there's the open access libguide that I mentioned already from DB. Um, there's the research data management libguide, which helps sort of cover some of the overlap between sharing data and sharing your research output. Share your paper and the Creative Commons license sticker. Um, and of course, you can get in touch with me uh, anytime.